such. So you think that we ought not to, um, we must find the solutions to the problems in ourselves. Obviously, because you have, you are the man who is going to suffer. You are the man who is going to <laughs> exactly. You are the person who is going to have all the problems of life. This series of talks by Krishnamurti represents the first time that he has permitted any of his talks or public appearances to be filmed. This program, titled Questioning, was filmed at the Thatcher School in the Ojai Valley in California. Uh, as we saw him last week, I now present him to you, Mr. Krishnamurti. all the things we talked about the other morning. You know, it is really quite difficult to ask questions. And one must ask questions right through life. The more we ask, the greater the understanding between our souls and our life. And also, we should, I think, in all asking questions and in and replying and understanding of that question, one should have a spot of skepticism. One can ask questions intellectually, argumentatively, to sharpen one's own brains at the expense of somebody else. So I hope you'll ask lots of questions, but to ask a question, it must be the right question. A wrong question will inevitably have no answer at all. But a right question, in the very asking of it, unfolds the, the understanding of it. And to ask a right question needs a great deal of intelligence, a great sensitivity, and a comprehension of the, of the immense complexity of life. Anybody can ask a question. That's the easiest thing to do. But to ask the right question and to go to the very end of that question, not verbally or intellectually or merely emotionally, but as a whole, as a total problem and a total issue. So I hope we can ask questions and see how far we can get together on that. There's a, probably a great hunger in India, as you said in your talk a couple of days ago. And I think I want to do something about it. And so I go to India, and uh, I try to help the people, and I try to uh, help them overcome their hunger and things of this nature. But is it really doing that much good? Going, you're, you're, you're going or my going to India and helping a little bit here and there doesn't get anywhere. You might give food for half a dozen people. Hmm? Do your best. But that's, you can't, there are 470 million people hmm? and doing a little bit there. It doesn't, I mean, I'm not laughing at you. It doesn't get any far, anywhere. Now, what will get, what will solve the problem? What will? What is the problem? Hunger. Hmm? Hunger, uh, lack of clothes, hmm? shelter, all that. Now, how is it going to be solved? Not by a particular nation. Hmm? As you and I can't solve the if we went in there, we couldn't solve it. No, sovereign government is going to solve this. No Indian government is going to solve it. 
They can pretend, and they do. Hmm? So, what is preventing the solution of this problem is nationalism. Hmm? My flag, your flag, my country, your country, hmm? and the division that takes place geographically, which is exploited by the politician. <laughs> that is the factor, one of the major factors of preventing the solution of starvation, of feeding the people. Now, science has means of giving food, clothes, and shelter practically to everybody. Hmm? It's not being done because of you are a British, I'm an Indian or Russian, we, we have our ideology and you have your ideology. Your king and my king. Your army and my army, all that's preventing us. So it's a world problem, not individual or nationalistic problem. Right. Well, how do you, uh, how do you suppose that uh, one day we'll overcome these nationalistic barriers? Okay? First, one has to be free of it oneself. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. One has to be free of it oneself. Hmm? Neither American nor Indian nor. Uh, right. Then get up and talk, shout, do anything for the for the not for the little things but for the major issues. Then perhaps you will have you will sow some seed that will take root. That's all. Hmm? Now, if every human being, educated, cultured, um, who is really serious wants to solve this problem, he will do something. Like war. We have accepted war as the way of life. All man has, throughout centuries. And to stop war, difference is concerned with the whole process of living as a human being. Then perhaps we'll be able to solve this question of war. We spoke last week of man achieving a clarity of mind and a broader view of life. But it, it would seem to me that one could achieve this clarity of mind and a greater, deeper understanding of life if you were to try to attack a certain part of it and then see the result and, and therefore understand what happened more deeply and so that's a increase his understanding. I understand. You mean there are these fragments, business, uh, religious, uh, poli political, science, hmm? and so on, fragments. Now, and you, by going through each fragment, hmm, you would understand the whole thing. Participation of in each fragment. Now, do you know what, the, what that implies? How long it would take for each person, for every individual to take each fragment and go through it, understand it? Hmm? To me, it seems to be impossible. Impossible, isn't it? Completely. completely impossible. And therefore, they say, let us put all these fragments together, which again is impossible. You can't, by through fragment, make the whole. Hmm? So, how do you then understand something totally? First of all, let's be clear, a fragment can never make the whole, right? And putting the fragments together is not the whole. And also that one that it is not necessary to go through all these, right? Through all the fragments. It's like saying uh, you, to, uh, you must get drunk to understand what sobriety is. Hmm? <laughs> and then that life is too short, you can't go through all of it. So if that is clear, then how does one 
see the whole of something, whole of life, life including sorrow, death, love, family, politics, economics, hmm? amusement, entertainment, uh, the misery, you know, this, all that. How do you see the whole thing? You to, you go into it. Sir. How do you see it? How would you? How would you? If that was a question, a serious question, you have to tackle. Hmm? Well, you Wait, wait. Moment you say you cannot or can, you are finished. You stop investigating. When you say, when you say, I can't, you are blocked, you have blocked yourself. But you can understand more and more of it. Not by blocking yourself. Look, sir, if I say there is no God, hmm, I have blocked myself, haven't I? Or if I say there is God, I have blocked myself. But if I say, I really don't know, let's find out, then I have the energy to go into it. Right? Now, so don't let us say yes or no. Don't let us take sides about it. <laughs> now, how would you see the totality of something, of life? You know, get a grasp of feeling of it a touch of it, a smell of it. Well, as I said, by trying to take more and more of it and understand more and more of it. <laughs> you have no time. I know. That's the problem. Sir. That's the problem, of course. You're saying that's that what you I said. That way. That's what I said in the beginning. Yes. Well, I, I mean, if I take time, time, you know, I... It would be impossible. So how, now, eliminate time. You follow so what we are doing? We are not, we are eliminating time, gradually get it. Mm -hmm. We are also eliminating fragmentary approaches, right? And also we are, in, we are eliminating the idea that when we put them all together, we will get an understanding. You have approached this problem with the habitual tools, mm -hmm. and you have eliminated those tools. Not because you are you are prejudiced against them, hmm? but you say that they won't answer. Now, when you have eliminated them because they do not answer, your mind is sharper, isn't it? If you are on the right track. Of course, you have eliminated them. <laughs> right? Your mind is very sharp. Because it, has, it is no longer following the traditional approach. Right? <laughs> but he must have some experience of the whole in order to and see it. No, no, no. To see the whole thing, you need a very sharp mind, very clear mind. A mind that is not biased. A mind that says, this I, I like this, I don't like. Uh, the mind that is in a pattern or expects to be led, it won't ever see the complete truth. But that does that necessarily mean that the mind that is free will will see the truth? If you want to see the view of that valley from the hill, hmm, you take a survey of the whole thing, don't you? Hmm? That means your mind is no longer merely fixed on the Thatcher school or a particular school. You look at the whole valley. So here is a whole complex map of life, hmm? business, all the rest of it, very complex. And to understand the whole of that, you must, you must be free to look. But you cannot look if you say, well, it must be, you can only look at it through a fragmentary approach. Therefore, we say, free the mind from fear. 
As long as there is fear, that fear will take shelter in a belief. Christian or doesn't matter what belief. Because fear demands comfort, security, hope, and all the rest of it. So being afraid of something, death or something else, that fear must take shelter in something. Therefore, whether you believe uh, in reincarnation or not, or some other belief, is the same. All beliefs are the same, because they are essentially born out of this fear. So really the question is, can fear be eliminated altogether? And that's why the religions and the ancient cultures have said, Believe, not know you. Yes, sir. Well, then to eliminate uh, the fear of death, say, from the mind, one must know what death is. How must you? No how death. can you know? Wait, sir. How can you know what death is when, when the mind is afraid of death? When I'm afraid of you. Right, but you can't, you can't get rid of your fear unless you know what, what it wait, is. Wait, sir, wait, wait. I'm afraid of you. Hmm? And therefore, I always take shelter. Hmm? I never look at you. Right? I barricade myself, I invent a lot of ideas, prevent myself from looking at you. Right? I can only look at you when I have no fear. And what am I afraid of? Not of death, but of something I have no my family, my job, my uh, my daily routine, the things I have, and I'm afraid of losing them. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Is it quite a? complex problem. You can't just my thought or your thought. I think opinion has very little place when, when we are faced with direct things of life. Most of us are guided by our personal inclination or personal idiosyncrasy or compelled by circumstances, which are all very small affair. But a problem like death is a problem of man. Whether he lives in China, India, or in Russia, or here, it's a problem which man has struggled with through centuries upon centuries. And the Egyptians, say, for instance, lived for them, death was much more important than living. And there are whole communities right through the world, historically and also when one has lived in a country like India, where culture is very, very ancient. There were all kinds of ideas, beliefs, dogmas about death. Death being, the, one is frightened of it frightened of that thing called death, which is going to put an end to everything. So they, they invent theories, like reincarnation. You know something about it? Either you choose that or the Christian belief, which depends upon your conditioning. If you are a Christian, naturally brought up in a Christian world, you will accept some that. The Christian dogma. Now, if one can put aside the Asiatic belief and the Christian belief and every form of personal hope and despair, and then we can investigate the the meaning of death. You see, as long as there is fear, hmm, the unknown death becomes a tragic affair. 
I don't know. Hmm? So, is it possible first to eliminate psychological fear altogether? That's quite a. I won't go into all that. Unless that is done systematically, with clarity, with, uh, without any arrière pensée, you know, without any holding back from this problem of fear, then one can go into this question of death very, very deeply. But otherwise, otherwise you you're caught in a rational, r- rational rationalization or in the whole of the Asian belief of reincarnation or a Christian belief. Or you are just you don't care. But it seems to me a society or a community or a group of people who are not concerned with death, who are not, uh, who are don't uns- have no foothold in life. You know what I mean? Have no, have nothing. Therefore, they become terribly superficial. That's what is happening in this country. Terribly uh, mundane, physical, and there, uh, no culture can stand that. Uh, do you agree that the, the fear of death is the, the fear of losing uh, um, your possessions, your the joys of life? Partly. Well, if, if that's so, then the person who has reached the state of clarity, who has cast off all his fears and fear of death, therefore he wouldn't. Um, the joy of life wouldn't mean anything to him. Oh. Is that now, where did it have that just be? Why not? How how do you lose the fear of death? By not fearing the, the ah. fear that you No, would. no. There must be much more positive reaction than that. You must die every day. die every day to the things that you call pleasure and pain, hmm? to the things which you have cherished, die. <laughs> Otherwise, what? look at sir, what are you? A bundle of memories, aren't you? Huh? Experience and knowledge, information, and that you carry on all the day along, all the years. And that bundle of memories keeps the mind very dull, stupid, not fresh. But if you say, well, I'll put away all my bundles hmm? <laughs> each day, your mind is strongly alert. Yes, sir. So if you were to do this and die every day and to get rid of all your fears, to reach this clarity of mind and to have an extremely sharp mind, would not you then be completely isolated from anything from the world, from life? All right. Completely why shouldn't you be? Why should you not be isolated? What is the world? Well, that's fine. I think it, it can be very good. But then, if you are going to do anything with this clarity of mind, such as change the world order, then you will change it. Then you will talk, right? Push, but you won't belong to the messy world. In order to change it, you do have to approach a part of it. For instance, uh, approach again. Take <coughs> the whole of it, not just parts of it. Tackle the whole issue, not just one part, partial issue. So look. So far, no one has been able to do this. <coughs> then let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> You said that we have to approach everything with an open mind and we mustn't take any point of view. But if we get confused, we'll judge. Well, when you s- approach, say, uh, what is life with an open mind, uh, you'll start and then you'll get one fragment you won't understand. And you'll question it and then you'll become confused. And then you'll, you know, you'll have to judge. Well, how are we supposed to um, do this without... First of all, there are contradictory informations. Mm-hmm. One propagandist says one thing, another propagandist says another. Mm-hmm. 
the priest says something, and the businessman, the military man, and the politician, everybody is contradicting the other, and you and people generally are the recipient of all that contradiction. Mm-hmm. Right? So what do you do? Judge. No. You realize you are the result of all these contradictions. How can you judge when I'm <laughs> No, I suggest, sir, I suggest, first of all, is it possible not to be influenced at all? <laughs> no. Huh? no. Don't say no. You see, the moment you say no, you've already taken a stand. <laughs> is it possible not to be influenced? <laughs> And that's very difficult, because we are the result of thousand influences – food, climate, hmm, and the culture in which you are born, <coughs> and so on so on. And we are the result of this terrific pressure and strains and influences. And I am that, you are that. And so how do you free yourself first from the influence, from your conditioning, and then <coughs> you can ask the question, how am I to keep clear all the time of confusion? Then it's very simple, you're not confused. <laughs> if we think <coughs> that um, Jesus is the Son of God. It limits us. If we think that he was some man who thought um, wisely and th- tried to teach people, it, it helps us to understand him better. Do you think so? I should think so. No. No, I, to me, you see, sir, that's not very great importance. What is great importance is not what somebody said or somebody did or did not. Can I, as a human being, hmm? lead a different kind of life. That's all. That is the crucial point. Not what Buddha, Kaya, all the people have said, well, it may be true, may not be true. What is important, what is essential and urgent, is can I live a different life altogether? This has been the sixth of eight programs presenting Krishnamurti whose extraordinary approach to the fundamental questions of our time has attracted wide attention in Europe, Asia and America. This program was filmed at the Thatcher School in California. The concluding two programs in this series are called Living and Death and the End of Conflict. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.